right, well, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for our Ignite Startup Workshop. My name is Amanda Bolden, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Herb Kelleher Entrepreneurship Center, uh, where we promote the development of entrepreneurial skills and support the exploration of the ways these skills can be applied to careers as founders or innovators within established firms. Our Ignite Startup Workshops provide an opportunity for students to learn more about different topics related to new venture creation. These workshops host leaders from various industries and on-campus experts and enable students, faculty, staff, and the greater Austin entrepreneurial community to gain usable skills and insights for launching an idea into a startup or pursuing other career opportunities. Today, we're excited to welcome Jason Kurtz to provide an overview of building and maintaining customer relationships. Jason has worked with Excel KKR since 2013 when he joined to launch the Excel KKR Consulting Group. Prior to joining Excel KKR, Jason worked at Ariba Inc., acquired by SAP in 2012 for 11 years in a variety of executive roles and served as a member of the company's management committee. Previously, he was a director in Arthur Anderson's business consulting practice, where he focused on helping companies create profitable revenue growth. He's also worked at ESPN as an associate producer and currently serves on the board of directors of ISOL, Unimarket, and Basewear. Jason received his MBA from the Darden Graduate School of Management at the University of Business, at, I'm sorry, at the University of Virginia in Marketing and Finance, and he received a Bachelor of Journalism and a Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Texas at Austin. Jason, welcome. We're excited to have you. For Thank you for having me. You yeah. can um, submit questions to the chat, and we will be answering some of those as Jason goes along. So if you think of something as he's talking, feel free to put that in chat, and we can address it then. We'll also have time at the end of the workshop to answer any questions as well. With that, Jason, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate it. And yes, I, let's, I, I have some prepared remarks and a couple of very, very simple slides to kind of get us going and getting us through here. But definitely feel free to make this interactive. It would, would be great to answer any questions you have. Happy to, to tackle any topics. And then, you know, just to, to get the chat going and things like that. Uh, one of my favorite things about whenever I get back to Austin, I always like to make sure I get the best barbecue around. So if you want to drop in the chat your favorite barbecue place these days in Austin, I'm a Terry Black's and Love Barbecue are kind of my favorites as of now. But if you've got another one besides Franklin's, I know about that one, but drop it in the text and I'd love to uh, to hear from folks. Um, I thought I'd start with uh, I'll give a quick intro, although Amanda did a great job of kind of giving the overview. And then I'll just share uh, some of my, you know, lessons learned from my career journey. Amanda hit on, you know, kind of the main companies that I've worked with over the years. And so um, I think I took a little bit of something from each of those stops along my career path. And, and hopefully there'll be interesting kind of lessons learned uh, and, and, uh, and best practices to share with each of you. And then happy, again, happy to wrap things up with Q and A, but don't wait till the end. Let's definitely uh, ask questions as we're, we're going through this. Amanda gave my, my history, but I, as she said, kind of a Longhorn grad from 1990, uh, degrees in, in journalism and, and business, I also married a Longhorn. So my wife was a McCombs grad as well as a finance major and is now an artist. And as I was telling Amanda before we started, I have twin sons who are freshmen in college, one in Indiana and one at University of Oregon. So I've been visiting lots of different schools over the, the fall. I've made it to Austin twice. I've made it to Indiana and made it to Oregon. I've seen football games at all of them. So it's been a, a fun but, uh, but busy fall. And I always like to start these kind of discussions with quotes and you see, you know, a couple, I think, pretty familiar names with founders who have been pretty darn successful in their lives, just like hopefully, you know, all of you will be, you know, equally successful or more so. Um, and, and what I take away from these quotes and what, what I find interesting about them is that each in their own way, I think, talk about, you know, common themes, which is about acquiring and keeping those customers. But at the heart of it, it's really about 
understanding your customers and knowing them as well as they know themselves, whether that's a business or an end consumer, and really understanding the value that they derive from whatever it is that you are selling them or providing them. And so I think that's a, that's a really important thing to kind of keep in mind. So understanding the value and, and the impact you're having on, on your customers' lives and, and their organizations, and then really making sure every step along their journey and their kind of life cycle of use of or customer experience of using your product or service just continuously gets better. And you think about all the ways that you or your organization or your product, or your service interacts with customers and how you can make it better and how you make sure you're delivering that experience that you want your customers to have. So with that, you know, those are kind of themes that uh, that we will talk about, I think, as we as we go through this. I'm going to, you know, and jump into my career journey and kind of go, you know, I'd say company by company and and kind of share some of the lessons learned and kind of big takeaways that I had uh, when I worked at each of these. But I, I just pause real quickly. Any any questions? Any you know topics you want to make sure that we cover while we're going through the session? Otherwise, I'll I'll, I'll let it rip. But wanted to pause and give you guys an opportunity to to jump in and see if there's anything you want to make sure we cover. All right. Silence is golden, I guess. So we'll start at my days at, at Arthur Anderson in the business consulting practice. And as Amanda said, I focused on profitable revenue growth. So, you know, helping companies um, with their marketing, their sales, their customer service. And you will see, you know, I would say a, a somewhat common trend across all of my different work areas and that I, I have personally tended to focus on the business to business world versus the business to consumer world. But I do think there's a lot of um, commonality in reality in, uh, in how we serve customers, how we treat customers, things like that. And so, you know, maybe the first thing that I took away that I'll share from my days at Anderson was really the fact that not all customers are created equal. So we really, and I apologize, I've got a dog that is eating voraciously in the background. I hope that's not uh, coming through loud, but he's right behind me. Um, all customers are not created equal, you know, and so the value of customer segmentation and understanding not only the profiles, the behaviors, what's important, uh, what's valuable to each of those customer segments, but the reality is how much revenue they provide you, how much profitability they provide you, and what the opportunity is for growth with those customers. Do you have a small share of wallet today? Are they growing as an organization and you're just getting started with them? Building your, well, first, having the knowledge of what customers are more valuable than others is, 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 is a really important starting point, but also understanding how do you serve each of those segments? So if there's a potential customer segment that's worth, you know, significantly more than other segments are, you have to develop uh, an experience uh, and a level of service and support for that set of customers to make sure that you grow with them. And I think that's a really important concept in a lot of cases, and probably more so in the business to consumer world or the business to small business world, people tend to treat all customers as equal. And what I think we found was that, you know, really was not the case, that that there is value in providing prioritized service, more tailored or customized service uh, to your most valuable customer segments. And then even the way you sell to them, uh, not just the way you service and support them, but even the way you sell them to them and reach them could be different across segments. And you want to tailor that cost of acquisition to the various segments. So a more valuable segment, you, you know, you're willing to spend and invest more for a lower value segment. You have to find ways to do it in an efficient and effective way. So that's, that's one, you know, kind of really important lesson. The other one, which was really a surprise to me, which coming out of, you know, I'd come out of UT, then I went and worked at ESPN and I was in a, I was a feature producer. So really not on the business end, more on the media side of the world. And then I went to back to school and got my MBA, as Amanda mentioned, at Darden at UVA. And then I joined Anderson. And what I quickly, you know, kind of came to realize that sales is the lifeblood of every company. 
And I really didn't have an appreciation for that. And I really, you know, in full disclosure, coming out of, you know, college and business school and, you know, being a journalist, I kind of realistically looked down on sales a little bit and thought, you know, that's something that anyone can do. And what I really came to understand and realize is it, it sales is the avenue for growth, right? And growth creates opportunities and growth creates, you know, great businesses. And without an appreciation for the, the science and the process of selling, it's hard to achieve all that, you know, that most organizations want to achieve or that you want, might want to achieve with your uh, companies that you're starting and founding. And so I think really, no matter what your discipline is, as someone who's starting a business uh, and trying to grow and, and launch a business, having an appreciation and an understanding for, for, for selling and then keeping and managing uh, customer relationships is really important. So there are, I, I've run into lots of founders who think as long as we build a great product, they will come, right? Customers will come. And I and, and I think Anderson was the first stop along my journey where I really learned that you really have to value and appreciate and invest in the sales process. And as a leader and a founder of a company, you really have to help your sellers or help your sales process and understand it and uh, and be sympathetic and, and empathetic to the to the challenges that are inherent in in trying to convince customers that they should do business with you or buy your product or service. Now I'm going to pause. I'm going to stop. Hopefully, maybe we have a question or two, or make sure this is on track. Is this interesting? Do you want me to pivot? Anything else you want me to cover? Let's. Uh, now would be a great time to hear from folks. You think? So far, no questions. Okay. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I'll keep going. Whoops. Am I still presenting? Sorry. Do you still have my slides? It's, it's out of presenter. So it's out of full screen. Got it. Got it. Go. Okay. Got it. So now I will transition to, I guess, Ariba days. So I had a number, and maybe just to give you a little context. So I had a number of different roles at Ariba, which was a software company. Um, when I was there, we grew from 100 million in revenue to 550 million in revenue. And we were eventually acquired by SAP while I was there. And I had three primary roles. Uh, part of my time there, I ran a professional services team or an implementation team. So we helped our companies or our customers implement and start to use our software. And then I moved over and was uh, running North American sales and then our global strategic account program. So our top 30 accounts globally. And then finally, I was GM of our largest business unit. So sales operations, P&L responsibility globally for, um, for one of our product lines, which happened to be our, our biggest product line. Um, and so, again, a couple of lessons learned, you know, in, in this one, I think what I learned and, and particularly around uh, what I would call customer management. So keeping, retaining and growing your customers is the importance of customers realizing the value and, and that they intended to get when they bought your company or when you're sorry, when they bought your product or service. So in, we talked about the sales process and, and having an understanding of that and making sure um, we, we do a great job of selling. Part of selling is articulating the value that our product or service can provide to a company, to a consumer, to an individual. And so understanding how that customer translated your value kind of definition into their world is really important. So for example, at Ariba, we sold a software called product that was, it's e-procurement. So it's how large companies like Dell or Bank of America buy the goods and services that they use and consume within their organization. So much like, you know, Amazon is for consumers who want to go buy things, Ariba essentially offered the same kind of capability 
to businesses with additional workflow and controls that a business might want to have over its it over what it purchases or what its employees purchase. And so a big driver of the value that our customers achieved and what we articulated to them in the sales process was around uh, spend under management. So if you if you're Dell and you spend fifty billion dollars a year, ideally you'd have fifty billion dollars in purchases going through the Ariba system. But that doesn't happen overnight, right? Just like Amazon didn't immediately have a billion dollars in revenue uh, or sales, it took years and years and years to get to that. What, so what we tried to do is understand how a company like Dell, how what its goals were. If they wanted to, you know, acquire in, uh, or spend, you know, a billion, and then ten billion, and then twenty billion of their spend through our system over time, we tried to understand that and help them build a plan for how they were going to get their internal users to to buy the, uh, in that way, and how they were going to get their suppliers or vendors to be to sell through the Ariba solution. And so understanding their goals and objectives and making sure we had a plan for them for how they were going to achieve their goals and objectives. And we kept reminding, and you have to keep reminding them of what their plan was, the value that they got from the plan and the results they're having and the value that's contributing to the business. If you do those things to make sure, and this is obviously in a business to business setting, that your customers understand the value and they're achieving the value that they set out, that gives you the right to keep them as a customer, but also sell more stuff to them over time. And so that really gets to kind of the second point of, of kind of lessons learned from Ariba, which is around the value of having happy, having really happy customers that are getting the value that they hope to get and that you hope to provide them is that you get the right to sell them more things and grow your business with them. Just like, and I'll use the consumer and going back to uh, one of my original slides and the quotes was from Amazon, right? Amazon, and you may or may not remember this, but they started out just selling books and the, nobody, you couldn't buy anything else but books from Amazon. And they did such a good job of selling people like me books that they earned the right to sell everything else under the sun and the planet, you know, kind of category by category by category over the time by making sure it was valuable for me and I had a positive experience. And so, and now Amazon, you know, at times one of the most valuable companies on the planet and what obviously one of the most successful. So how did they do that? They kept selling, they kept adding customers, but they also kept selling people more and more and more things. And so if you look at a software company like Ariba, you know, over 50% of our new sales in a year over time came to new customers. We added a product portfolio of additional capabilities and, uh, and applications or products that our customers could buy. And that's really what continued to fuel the growth, growth of our business. Just like Amazon, if you look and see what percentage of their revenue is tied to books now, I don't know the exact answer, but my guess is it's less than 10% of their revenue. I'm pretty sure it's probably less than 5% at this point comes from selling books, but it's all the other stuff that we buy that can use to help and fuel their growth much more than customer acquisition. But you can only do that when you've delivered a great customer experience, you've made it easy for them to accomplish what they want to accomplish, and you've made sure that people receive the value that they wanted to receive from that, uh, from that purchase decision, from using your product, from things like that. Again, I'll pause. So two, two more lessons learned there, one around um, the importance of driving value and adoption and usage of, your, of a product or service, and then the other around the value of cross-selling and adding products and building a portfolio over time. Um, one more you know, thought I'll, I'll add on, just the piece around adoption and value is you cannot, here's what I would tell you, you cannot expect in most cases to assume that your customer will know how to consume or use your product or service. You have to show them and teach them how to do it and to, to extract the value that they want to extract out of it. Because remember, you live in your product or service every single day. 
and you may have helped hundreds or hopefully thousands or millions of customers use it, but the customer uses it once, right? This is the first time in many cases they're using that kind of product or service. And so they need to be guided and helped through using your service or product to be able to make sure that they get the value out of it. All right, I'm going to pause. Any any questions on Ariba days, on Anderson days? Oh, I got one question from Jane. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. So um, when you're working with customers versus businesses, what's the frequency of um, interaction or the difference in frequency and interaction that you have with customers versus businesses? And when you say customers, you're meaning like consumers? consumers. like you yeah. yeah. I think it really varies. Uh, I don't think there's one right answer to that question. I think this really gets back to knowing your customers really, really well and understanding what it, what it takes. So um, I'm trying to think of a great example. So um, let's try and think, you know, with, uh, I'll take my iPhone as an example. So um, when you buy a new iPhone and you've got the new version or you buy an iPhone for the first time, you get a lot of handholding at the beginning, right? And then, you, you know, they help you turn it on and load your data and your contacts and get your email set up. And they've continued to make that easier and easier over time. So you've got a pretty functioning capability right away. But they also have Apple Care, and you can go to the Apple Store, but but those tend to be infrequent things, but they tend to touch base with you within the first, I don't know, week, two weeks, and a month, just to check in and make sure um, that you're having a good experience and things are working. I think that's pretty normal. And then, you, but then at what at some point, it is nice to reach out to customers and and give well one give them opportunities to self select in to reach out to you when they need help and have a community. But then I do think it makes sense to reach out to customers on a semi regular basis and check in and um, see how they're doing and whether they need other things. And I think you've seen Apple expand its product line over over the years because of that. Uh, and now you see them selling lots and lots of different things and us buying as consumers, lots of different things. But I really think, and then in the business world, again, I think it goes back to really understanding your customers and what it takes. So, and then tailoring it to those various segments is, is another element to this. So for example, a really high value segment that spends a lot of money with you and will has the opportunity to buy lots from you you probably want to reach out more than less. Uh, for those that are lower value customers or consumers, you know, you don't have to reach out it frequently. But just to give you a sense, I'll, I'll use Ariba as an example. So we had our strategic account uh, team, which I led. So that was our top 30 accounts on a global basis. We had a team of 10 people that were dedicated to serving those customers to make sure that they were happy, to make sure they were getting the value and to sell them more stuff, <laughs> frankly. And, you know, but each of those customers could generate, you know, millions of dollars uh, in revenue a year and potentially millions more in the future. And we talked to them nearly every day. You know, we would have regular you know, monthly reach outs to their executive sponsors to see how things were going from their perspective. We did a quarterly business review every quarter where we re reviewed what value and adoption and usage they were getting versus what we were seeing and how other customers were doing. So we were constantly kind of in communication. If you went down to the next tier of our customers that were kind of the, you know, middle customers, you might have one person serving 10 customers and, and, and have a much smaller portfolio of, of interactions and touches because you're serving more people or more customers. And then our bottom segment, our least valuable customers, you probably had one person covering 60 or more accounts. And so obviously there you're going to interact less frequently, but you have to find ways to automate that interaction and make sure you're touching people, your customers, when they when it makes sense, 
but you have to build in those different scenarios and service levels and and support based on again that segmentation that we talked about in Anderson. So, uh, you know, I, again, I wish there was an exact right answer for this, but I think it really does vary by the product or service that you that you provide, how easy it is to consume, how much adoption and usage, and how valuable the customer segments are. Thank you. Was there any other questions? All right, I will keep going then. Uh, and I'll move on to Excel KKR. So Excel KKR is a private equity firm. We invest in B2B software companies. So only business to business software companies. Typically those companies are somewhere between 10 million in revenue, uh, and 200 million in revenue when we make our initial investment. And our goal is to you know, help them grow and accelerate their growth and profitability. And so if you look across our portfolio, we have over 60 companies that kind of fit this profile of, of B2B software companies that are you know, 10 million and, and more in revenue. And again, a couple of lessons learned as we think about uh, acquiring and um, and maintaining and growing those customers. One is the world has changed, you know, over the last couple of years in terms of how we sell to you know, potential customers and prospects. And again, I'll use a business to business setting first. And that is it, it. But I think it's again, it's very applicable to consumer world as well. It used to be, particularly in the software world and B2B software world, where you had to take your product out and educate the market and you did that through a face-to-face a -face or telephone calls interaction between a salesperson and a potential, you know, purchaser within within an organization. Now, what I think you see because of the proliferation of information and the internet and and all kinds of other uh, dynamics is your prospects are researching your product or service and probably go 50 or 60% of the way through a buying journey or discovery journey before they interact with you in any way. And so you have to make information available to them so that they can do that research and enable them to do that. So sometimes that's on your website. Sometimes that's through you know analysts that cover the market that review products and services. Sometimes that's through you know LinkedIn and putting information out there. It could be a variety of different um, mediums that you do that. But it's really important to understand that people are forming perceptions out there in the market before they even interact with you and have a perception of your strengths and weaknesses. And you need to understand what what's out there and what the market is saying about you so that you can engage in that discovery process with the buyers and be able to understand if they think this is a weakness for you because that's what the market is telling them or what they probably have discovered how do you turn that into a strength or overcome that weakness you need to think through that or if it's a strength how do you amplify that in some way and to continue to differentiate that and you need to know that about you and you need to know that those things about your competitors so that you can position and deposition them as well in, in that kind of a situation. So understanding and appreciating the fact that customers do their and prospects do their own research and you have to not only one, provide information into the market so that they can do that, but two, you have to um, understand what that information is, not only about you, but also your competitors uh, in the market. Does that make sense to folks? Again, I'll, I'll, I'll take silence as, uh, as golden here. I think the other thing that I would say, you know, we take away from my days at Excel KKR or, or the last nine years at Excel KKR really gets back to that customer journey and customer experience that, that you saw in the quotes before. And that is customers or prospects want a very, they want to feel like their interactions with you are very tailored uh, to them and their needs, their values, their pains, and that you have prepared for them and researched them. 
and, and really understand uh, who they are and, and what their needs are going to be. And so what you've seen evolve in the world of kind of B2B selling is this concept of account-based marketing, which is tailoring your messages and your um, differentiators and what, what you learn, uh, what you're putting out into the market to the specific prospect that you are trying to uh, acquire. And so while it, the goal is to make it both scalable in that it's a relatively consistent message from prospect to prospect, but make it feel to the prospect like you have done your research, done your homework, and you are tailoring that message in some way to them that makes them feel special and unique and, and heard and appreciated. And so how do companies accomplish this? So one way is a vertical or industry-based approach. So for example, say at Ariba, we sold our software to any company, whether it's Dell or Bank of America or General Motors, it didn't really matter the industry, but you could make it feel more tailored if you talked specifically to someone's industry like you know, the banking industry. And you could say, hey, we know if you're a bank, the way you buy things is different than the way Dell does. And you tend to buy different things. You buy more services than, than uh, inputs and components to your laptops. You tend to buy marketing services or hire people on, you know, temporary labor assignments or consulting assignments. So the profile of your spend is different. So understanding those nuances and be able to tailor them to a specific company or industry is a way to differentiate that. And then the other part of that too is that gets back to the preparation and research is when you do get into a sales cycle and you are going to finally have your interaction with a customer or prospect, it's making sure you, you do your homework, right? So as an example, I would never go into a meeting with a sales prospect or with an existing customer where I didn't know exactly who was going to be in that meeting from that customer and prospect and have researched them in some way, probably LinkedIn, because I'm a bit of a LinkedIn junkie, and looked at their profile and looked them up. And when I get into start that discussion, I'm probably find, trying to find some form of commonality with that person that I discovered through LinkedIn or Google search or whatever it is about them. And, and then I connect with them afterwards on LinkedIn and with follow-ups from the discussion or some interesting aspect of the discussion to show that I researched, I prepared, I followed up, I knew who they were, I know what's important to them, I, maybe I've re researched the company, I've looked at their annual report, I've understood what their kind of big picture init strategic initiatives are, I understand what's going on to business, like those kind of things of researching the company and researching the people that you're going to be meeting with have become what we in poker call table stakes in the world of selling. And so it, it's absolutely critical that you are prepared and you've done your research. If you don't do that, it will negatively impact the perception that that customer or prospect has of you, because I promise you the next person who comes in to sell them something will have done their research and homework or highly likely that they will have done that. And that's part of the experience is feeling like you've done your homework, you've heard them, you've understood them, and you've done the research to understand how what your product or service does to help the customer and help them on there as a customer. So again, kind of big lessons learned there around the way companies uh, and people buy, they do a lot of their own research before they even engage with you. And so you need to know that, prepare for that, share information, understand what the market is saying. That's one. And then two, tailoring your message and your sales pitch and how you to sell to people by doing your research and your homework. And then I would say the, the third piece of this is, and it's really related uh, in particular, I think, to the second one around doing your research and your homework and tailoring is the average buyer, whether that's you or me as a consumer, or whether that's somebody who's doing purchasing at Dell or Bank of America or GM, whatever, or Tesla or wherever, is they are inundated with messages, right? How many ads do we see a, a day on 
TV, radio, apps, the internet, Google, whatever, Facebook, Snapchat, the ads are everywhere. And people are constantly being uh, inundated with those messages. So the thing you have to do is break through that clutter so that your message gets heard. And then we've done extensive research, particularly in the B2B context with people who tend to buy things and that could be a chief technology officer, chief information officer, chief financial officer, chief purchasing officer, heads of sales, like who, who is it that buys products and services? And what we hear from them constantly is the value of a referral. So a, almost a warm handoff. So someone who I consider a leader or a peer or sits in the same shoes that I do, if if I get a story from someone who's marketing to me or selling to me that can relate that you know, peer of mine and the value they received and why they use the, your product or service, then I am more inclined to take that meeting, take that call, respond to that email, or do more research on your product. And how do you do that? How do you get your customers to do that for you, to be a case study, to say nice things about you in reviews. You do that by giving them that great experience and by making sure that they are achieving the value from the purchase of your good or service that they intended to get. It all kind of comes back together around the value of that. If you do a great job, if you've given them, if they're receiving the value that they hope to receive, if they're having a good experience, then they will help you sell more and be a referral uh, to the next customer. And that is the way without question, particularly in the B2B context, but everywhere that people and companies buy is through hearing how other people have consumed or used that product or service. So that's the third piece is this value of breaking through the clutter and the use of referral uh, marketing uh, in particular from really satisfied and happy customers uh, is, is without question the number one way to break through the noise of the marketing and sales world right now. And with that, those are my prepared thoughts and comments. Hopefully those were useful, hopefully aligned with kind of what you were hoping to hear uh, about. And, and we covered a lot of topics that would be of interest. Now's your time to ask questions. You can ask questions on these topics. You can ask questions about other topics of being an entrepreneur and starting a business. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. Fire away. I'm, I'm here for you to, to answer any questions you have. Um, Jason, if, if people maybe formulate their questions, uh, drop them in chat. Um, okay. I, I'll, I'll throw a question your way um, to get it started. And my question, I get this question quite a bit from students, is about um, tracking the customer relationship. Yeah. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about the importance of that and the types of information generally you may want to keep track of as you're facilitating relationships with customers? Yeah, that's and that's a that's a great question. And the great news is on that there are way more tools today to help you do that than there there were a few years ago. So I think what you would typically find today is there's kind of two buckets of places where companies go to do that. There's what you typically hear about as customer relationship management. So what does that have in there? It has things like, and I'll start, I'm obviously starting with the data piece of this. It has your name, it has your company name, it has your contact information, it has the history of all of the sales interactions or marketing interactions we've had with you. It knows which ones you looked at most likely and which ones a customer didn't look at. It has all the people, it maps out, if you work at Dell, it maps out potentially all the people who we might want to sell to at Dell. So it's all your potential users and different profile information. What's their profile? What's their financial profile? What's their risk profile? What do they sell? What do they buy? Like all this information to get to know the customer. So you understand again, what they're looking for, what's important to them, what their values are. So any of that profile information, it probably has the strategic initiatives that they may have laid out in an annual report if they're a publicly traded company. All of that data is consumed. Once they become a customer, 
it has their contract, it has their pricing, it has who their account team is. So who's going to serve them, who's important on their side. Again, um, all of those pieces of information. It will have all of the things that they have bought from you over time. Uh, and it will have all of their history of interaction. So did they call support? How many times have they called support? Is that trending up or down? Uh, are they a reference customer? In other words, will they be a referral for you? That's in there. Uh, how Did we meet with them and talk about the value? Here's what we showed them. All of that history is tr should be and typically is tracked today. All of those interactions can be captured and kept. And typically, there, there are a lot of there's a lot of value in that. But also, one of the really interesting things is you can see when do customers typically buy more from us. So, for example, you know, if you said you, what you can discover is if we have a product portfolio of 10 different products and usually say 50% of the time a company buys product A first, you might see in the data as you can collect it over time that usually somebody who buys A buys B about six months later and buys D 12 months later. And so before you get to those points, you can start to have, hey, if you're like other customers, you may want to use this because of this value and, and that you can receive and how other customers are received it. So all there's great insights that can be gathered. Then the other kind of information that you see typically gathered is all of the information around usage, adoption, and the value that they're getting. So in the business to business world, there's a there's been a whole new set of capabilities built around um, customer success management is kind of the genre or what people call it. And so it tracks all of the usage that a customer has so that, again, you understand how that's tracking over time, how that compares to what the original plan was, um, translates that into ROI and the value, it, all of those things. So that, again, collects all that data. Why do we want that data? We want to know, we want to be able to predict is a customer happy? Are they not happy? Are they going to churn? Are they going to keep using? Are they going to buy more stuff? And you see, you typically see all of that and how they use and engage with your products and services. So those, I would say profile information and history of the relationship and then usage and adoption are kind of the two big buckets of data that we see. And so through this, I think I, I hopefully answered part one of that, which is tracking the history of that relationship. As an investor and someone at Excel KKR, one of the we're, we're going to ask you a couple of things. We're going to say, what's the lifetime value of your customer? So the only way you're going to know that is if you know how much it costs to sell and you know how long they stayed with you and how much they spent with you over time and what and when people churn or or continue using the product. So those are like your cost to sell, your customer acquisition costs, your lifetime value, and, and then your retention rates. You get those three pieces of data. Th that's what every investor will ask you for. And so you can only do that if you are collecting that data and managing that life cycle entirely from when you first start to interact until they leave you or you're able to get them back. And so it's critical to understand that entire journey. And then also map, again, coming back to that customer experience, map those interactions, those touch points from everyone in the organization. So people talk about you know, the customer experience and your account manager or customer success person being important, but you know what? Finance sends them a bill. They wanna be able to read their bill and understand it. Support may answer questions when they call or email. If somebody has to wait two hours and then they get someone who doesn't, you know, can't resolve their problem, they're not going to have a good experience. You know, every department in a company impacts it, and it's and it's really important to map and understand that life cycle and be able to capture that. Does that answer your question? It does. That's great. Um, and then we've had um, a, a comment in chat that I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on. Sure. Um, and and translating some of what you talked about to um, entertainment venues or guest services types of of, of um, industries. And what are some of your suggestions for areas that are more uh, short term engagement, but still focused on seeking retention and bringing those people back? 
Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to use UT as examples here, right? So if you think about what's gone on just around football games, so if we're going to talk about entertainment and event and venues, look, I've been going to football games at UT for, I'm going to date myself here, 40 years. Uh, uh, and, and so I was a very small child, 40 something years. And the experience today is dramatically different than the, than it was before. There was no Bevo Boulevard with all kinds of food and games and stuff for kids and adults. There was no Austin City Limits pre-game concert or post-game concert. There, none of that existed, right? And so, how did there was no Wi-Fi in stadiums, right? There were the food choices were limited. You had a, a hot dog, you had a pizza, you had a beer, a soda. Right. So all of that is understanding your customer. And I give Chris Del Delcani, the athletic director, tons of credit for. And he, I remember I got emailed. I got a research survey when he came on board asking me, amongst others, as a season ticket holder, what's important to you? What's what do you want to do? What's going to improve your game day experience? The scoreboards have changed just even in the last year or two. The music has changed like all of these things have changed. Because Chris Del Conte came in as the new athletic director and he actually reached out to people and tried to understand if we get you in, how do we get you into the stadium? And I would argue he actually had another uh, ulterior motive, which was how do I get you into the stadium sooner and earlier? Because you used to have people showing up at halftime and missing half the game so that you're, you're there early, you're loud and you're having a good time. And how do I do that? And so I think all of this experience has been designed from that research and insights that he gained from that. And then I will t I'll go a step further. I guarantee you that at some point in time, and he probably continues to refresh it, they do a segmentation of the customer base as well. And the student experience is different than the average season ticket holder experience, which is different from the person who buys a suite or the club seats. Who are you know are getting all kinds of food and drink combined with their seats and they're getting and they're sitting in the end zone and the and the players come through like all of those are different experience. I'm a low on the totem pole season ticket holder, but I still get an email every week asking me about my experience when I went to the game. I still get surveyed uh, on a regular basis, but I guarantee you that you know a buddy of mine who owns a suite. I know he gets he gets to go meet with Chris Del Conte and Chris Del Conte calls him and has lunch once a year with him. Right. So it's mapping that experience, understanding the value. It all comes back to that. The principles are the same. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm just having a few other thoughts as we as I go through this, that guest experience. Right. You talk about short term engagement. You know, some of the things around our comfort of the seats, shortness of concession lines, you know, the bathroom experience. Right. All, all of these things contribute to it and get improved over time so that more people will go to the games. They will spend more money. They will be better fans. And look at UT does not have the biggest, you know, athletic revenue in the country for no reason, because they've done a great job of doing exactly these principles, but uh, translating them to entertainment venues. Does that, does that answer the question? Like, does that resonate? Hi, this is uh, Pam, and I did ask the question. Uh, thanks, Jason, for being here. I know talking to a bunch of still pictures is uh, 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 always a, a little difficult, but um, that's life today. I, I think that you um, that those things are very important. I think those special events for um, you know the ticket holders you mentioned are great. I think it's also important to keep in mind that conflict resolution. Yeah, um, as it occurs. And having a staff or staff of volunteers that are well trained. I think that's a great point. That's part of the experience, right, is is having a great uh, service experience. And look, if uh, if if you're there and you, there's a fight in the stands and you get punched in the face, that's not a good experience. Right. That's why we have security. But also you raised a great point, which is recovery. Right. So if I have a customer that has a bad or negative experience, one of the greatest ways to turn them into a raving fan is by resolving that issue that they have 
in a responsive way, hearing them, resolving it, taking ownership of it, and turning it around. I have seen lots of customers who we thought were on the brink of leaving or stopping using the product because they were having a bad experience, but we resolved it and they became our biggest customers. So that great point around you know problem or issue resolution. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, and you know, Jason, one thing that I I really appreciated what you've talked about today, and this is something I tell students all the time, is this process is ongoing forever and ever. And even the idea of product market fit, anytime you're going to roll out a new feature or a new product, you're going through this process. That's right. Continuously, there's it, it doesn't stop. That you're always you're always working in this process on some level. It. it Apple is still doing it, right? They're still adding new features that they talk to their customers about. They're still adding new, but they didn't have a watch a couple of years before a couple of years ago, but someone figured out through talking to customers, we ought to sell a watch and people would buy it and it'd be awesome. It's not just the Mac computer, right? It's evolved over time and they did it because they created raving fans who love them, thought their product and service and experience was better. And they keep keep researching the customers so well, it gets right back to that original quote. They know us better than we know ourselves and they design that into their products, but they keep doing it over and over and over again. As you're, to your point, it never stops. Wow. Well, Jason, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Always very helpful uh, when you join us and, and, and talk on this topic. Um, uh, we've enjoyed having you. Uh, I'm thankful to all of our attendees for joining us today. And, and um, we do have one more Ignite Startup Workshop for this semester. Next Wednesday, we'll be talking about proving early traction. Um, so I hope you will join us for that. And then next Tuesday, we have Entrepreneurship Live with Brian Kruver, founder of Alert Media. Hopefully you will all uh, join us for that as well. That will be in person. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I would just say one thing, Amanda, if, if I can be of any assistance, reach out, connect with me via LinkedIn, and I'm happy to help in any way I can. Love uh, giving back and helping students and, and entrepreneurs in any way I can. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and let me know if I can help. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you to everybody who attended today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Look at more. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.